Hello and thank you for joining us. The following video is an extract from one of a series of Academic Wednesday Worldwide webinars hosted by the Institute of Economic Affairs in cooperation with the Vincent Centre at the University of Buckingham. In this video, we hear from Christian Sandstrom and Carl Venberg on the economics of innovation and the dangers of active industrial policy. And this was based on their new book, Bureaucrats or Markets in Innovation Policy. Thank you so very much for that brilliant introduction, Said. And thanks everyone for joining this webinar. We'll be presenting short excerpts from our recent book, Bureaucrats and Markets in Innovation Policy, a topic of no wider relevance of today than at any time. Um, right now, innovation policy is around the corner. Uh, industrial support systems are being launched in, to cover the tracks of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, every nation and every region in the world are asking themselves, how can we mitigate the effects of the pandemic and how can we prepare for the industry of tomorrow? The industry of tomorrow is unknown, right? And as we will go through in our book, this has been attempted many, many times in history and often with abysmal effects. So I'll be showing a couple of slides of studies we've been done in Sweden, um, which we call the dead end of industrial policy. And um, I'll be also be uh, comparing uh, the findings of ours with relevant evidence in the UK, the US and the European Union. And towards the end, we'll open up with some Q&A and some general conclusions. Okay, everyone can see this. Say it, nod. Yes. Yes, sorry, yes. So industrial policy worldwide has been being ramped up. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, before the oil shocks, this was the believed way to the future for big states to plan ahead, five, 10 year plans, um, targeting R&D investments, to believed sectors or areas of the future. Um, this has been reoccurring, and not least driven by the EU policies of transformation towards a green economy. And the European Union has unleashed a 10 year program with massive investment and targeted support to very, very specific sectors. Just following uh, a uh, similar investment vehicle done uh, during the financial crisis in the US, uh, where uh, US massive investments in infrastructure, um, job creation, uh, innovation, fell quite far short of reaching the targets. Uh, and similar evidence of debate on a smaller scale has been noted in the United Kingdom. So governments around the world are spending billions of taxpayers' money uh, for targeted support of specific sectors, technologies, and companies. And given this targeted support, which is believed, of course, to bring benefits to the overall population and the competitiveness of the economy, one should ask the question, what are the results of such support system? And there are evaluations, but sometimes they're hard to find. So we will present some evidence from a five-year investigation that we've done on targeted support in Sweden. A short backdrop to this problem is that there is a logical reason for government activities. As we've shown on the graph to the right, um, the output in terms of productivity growth has been decreasing. This is figures from the United States, but similar figures are available from other countries as well. So we put more and more investment into R&D, more and more researchers, both in private and public sector, but we have less innovation output. As we can see on the pictures to the left from The Economist, this uh, is relevant for all major industrial nations who over time put higher and higher ratio of investments in research and development, but with a lagging innovation rate. Many of you have heard of the Global Competitiveness Index, which ranks nations from one down to 200 on how competitive and innovative is the economy. Usually Singapore and Switzerland um, are in the top, but the United Kingdom and Sweden are often uh, quite high on the list as well. According to the Global Competitiveness Innovation Index, there are a number of key drivers of innovations. 
such as well-functioning um, competitive institutions, a well-trained workforce with high human capital, critical infrastructure, both physical and digital, and competitive markets, which allows for new entrants. Um, these factors, however, in particular, the well-functioning institutions and the competitiveness of markets are generally not what governments target. These areas are often outside the realm of innovation policy and in the hands of, say, the prime minister or the chancellor of the executor or uh, EU regulators. So how market functions and how institutions work in terms of intellectual property protection, in terms of regulating industries or not, that's often outside the boundaries of what is called innovation policy, although it's known to be the key determinants of effective innovations. So in a sense, what governments are trying to do is to affect the rate of innovation by tinkering with the system instead of address, addressing the large gaps in the system. So in a recent book, which is available on this webpage, that is the result of a series of academic investigations, empirical and theoretical, from a five-year project, uh, which has resulted in many academic papers, reports, conferences. Um, we have also reviewed the book, and in um, the pictures you see, you see an excerpt from that. Uh, Christian is going to walk you through the main contents of the book, and also some key highlights of the effectiveness of investigated Swedish innovation policies. And as we will see, the effectiveness of those policies are often quite abysmal. Christian, please. Thank you, Carl. Okay, so if we move to the next slide. Uh, here are some, uh, some of the information that we have brought forward. Um, we launched this book uh, late last year, and uh, we have written a couple of papers based upon the book, which are some of the more aggregated findings and conclusions. Uh, and we've had f a fair bit of impact as well on the Swedish debate. And uh, at present, we're trying to do something more internationally and in communicating those matters. So if we move on to the next slide, I will run you through some of the results from these studies. So uh, these innovation support systems are uh, normally justified by the notion of a market failure. And market failure with regards to the funding of innovation is normally concerned with that innovation on the one hand is uncertain. There is a large potential, but the early phases of, of R&D are expected to be so costly and so uncertain that no private actor would be willing to uh, make those upfront investments and uh, therefore we have a collection of various support systems where small firms and large firms can apply for money from various government agencies which then distribute money to those firms which they deem eligible for these uh, different R&D or innovation support schemes. So there are many evaluations of, of these studies over the years. Um, uh, but what was new with the studies we did back in 2015 and 16 was that we had access to data about all different firms that had received those uh, supports of various kinds over the years. And we were also able to statistically match that group of firms with uh, firms that are similar in terms of what sector they're in, uh, number of employees, and along a couple of different attributes. So these are fairly large sums for the Swedish economy. Our estimations say that uh, this is around 30 billion sec, uh, and uh, it goes to many different firms. And one of the first studies showed that there was no effect here on turnover employment or profit on these firms at all. 
And uh, in this study about Downfelt et al., the quote you can see is, absences of positive effects is a source of concern as administration costs, distortions of incentives, risks for crowding out and skewed competition need to be considered. And uh, when those results were presented, uh, the counter argument was that, well, the, the, the effect of uh, innovation support is indirect. And over time, there are spillovers, which you cannot possibly measure. And the counter argument to that would, I think, be that how can there be an indirect effect if there is no direct effect in the first place? Um, the second counter argument was that, well, the effect is actually much more in a longer time horizon. So you do not capture it within your time frame. And when we looked into that, we saw the opposite pattern here, where the effect actually declines over time. So in that paper was called the sugar rush of innovation subsidies, because the effect is a, a, an initial spike in investment, and then it levels off as the support levels off. And in one study, we looked at, well, uh, how are the differences now seen across regions in Sweden? And you could see a small positive effect in uh, densely populated areas, the larger cities like Stockholm. But in depopulated areas, the effects were negative. So uh, if we move on to, to the next slide, We also see here with these kind of support systems, we see the emergence of what we call a subsidy entrepreneurs. That is firms which systematically um, apply for these various support structures and they can go and apply it to the European Union, to a collection of different national agencies um, and uh, learn how to play and game the system. And in this time period, 1997 up until 2013, there were 15,800 Swedish firms that received some sort of grant. And out of those, 3,600 received more than two grants. And the winner here uh, got 38 different government grants for innovation. And uh, what this study then did was to look at the how uh, what kind of firms uh, do get many many uh, different grants, and we can show that the more grants they got, the lower productivity they had, and the higher wages they had. And how how would you possibly explain that? And and the logic is that it is the external supply of that kind of support which makes it possible to have low productivity and high wages. So Carl, over to you. So a key facet of these policies is to kind of kickstart something called regional uh, innovation funds or regional venture capital markets. Uh, this was successfully done in the country of Israel in the early 1990s. And since then, many countries and regions has been trying to get what they think of is a critical mass of private investors um, investing in that region or country. And usually the governmental vehicle for luring or, or incentivizing private investors is to add uh, public money to those investments. Sometimes that public money comes as um, interest-free loans, but quite often and more recently, uh, this comes as investments. So basically the public authorities, public um, office invests and takes an ownership share in newly started private companies. These are very, very high risk investments. Uh, and this is called government venture capital in the um, in the literature, and it's a very sizable industry. 
So what you see in this industry, which is primarily populated by former politicians, former public bureaucrats, some second rate venture capitalists and the like, is that they scout for interesting investments, usually bounded by regional areas where they are authorized to invest. Um, and if they are successful, um, they also try to have um, private investors invest in the same company. And the problem for these regional venture capital funds is very difficult to find good deals. Those companies in need of money usually see these uh, public investment vehicles as second rate, uh, and they go to the private venture capitalists first. Um, so a lot of this money remains uninvested and with no interest rate for um, the public. Uh, the investments that are made, however, um, show very, very scattered returns. One reason for the scattered returns, uh, which are low on the margin, but with high variance, is that it's very difficult for any public agency to mimic the harsh and brutal incentive structure of private investments. It's hard to recruit uh, professional investors from, say, London, Stockholm, New York City, where wages are high, uh, war for competency is, is uh, fierce. Um, and instead, there's often politicians and bureaucrats in these boards, which, which begs for very, very particular incentives problems, and sometimes even corruption scandals. Uh, so in a way, there's a trade-off between firms that need money to expand but they are not really good investments. And firms that are good investments, but they don't ask for government money because they already have private investments. Um, so this is seen in the exit rates of these funds when they uh, try to exit their investments is that it's very difficult to sell off the shares. Most often it's companies that buy back the shares themselves. So they use these private investment vehicles as soft loans instead as investments. Uh, so regional governmental capital systems has been argued to be the worst thing a government can ever do uh, because of these many malfunctionalities. Uh, one short example uh, for, of the peculiarities of regional support system is that there are so many different governmental bodies, public agencies, uh, semi private private, semi-public actors and regional actors trying to do the same thing, foster innovation and entrepreneurship. And this is a report from a, a newspaper in southern Sweden, which we are now investigating and following up because the figures are old. So with over 80 different organizations trying to do the same thing, what is an entrepreneur to, to do if he or she would like to get network support or support in international sales with 80 different organizations just in one small city. And this is a tendency that grows over time. And I'm sure you see similar patterns in the UK. So Christian, last slide, please. Yes. Uh, how do we explain this pattern? We see here an oversupply of support where the previous slide essentially showed that the amount of support um, just keeps growing over time, um, regardless of whether it is in demand or not. So the political economy of this um, is really that a targeted support has very few enemies and it has a couple of beneficiaries. One group would be politicians that appear to be decisive and in favor of something that is good, innovation. And then you have government agencies that are handing out this support and they are inclined to grow their budget. And you have a collection of firms who get free money and they are hardly against it. But the cost of shutting it down is very real because you as a politician would appear as being against innovation and entrepreneurship. If you combine this with a lack of coordination across the EU, national, regional, and municipal level, you would get more support over time, more supporting structures with their own defenders, and you would get less attention devoted to what Carl talked about in the beginning, 
namely creating a functioning market economy, devising, crafting the institutions that are required. So perhaps we should uh, conclude there saying that we have an oversupply of support. Uh, market failure is being used as the rationale to justify all this support. Problem with that argument is that you cannot measure really a market failure. So you have a problem that is theoretically derived, but you don't know the location of it, nor do you know the size of it, that supposed market failure. And if you then try to solve an unknown problem with policy making, and policy making is then subject to its own incentive and information problems, you will see policy failure becoming the result of this alleged market failure. So, Carl, shall we conclude there and uh, hand over to Syed? Yes, please. Well, Carl and Christian, thank you very much. Uh, if you, um, great, thank you very much also for unsharing your screen. Um, I've, in, the, in the meantime, while you were speaking, I put a couple of links into the chat function. One was a reference to an IEA uh, tax and growth book from 2016. And I raised, I, I included a quote from uh, one of the authors, Patrick Minford, who looked at the relationship between um, government R&D, if you like, uh, government subsidies to investment and R&D. And he found that there was no statistically significant relationship between R&D and growth. Um, so that, I just put that in. And also I put a link in there to Christian and Carl's book on the Ratio uh, website as well. So if there are any other links that either of the speakers want to put into the chat function, please feel free to do so. And also anyone taking part today, if you think there are any other relevant links, please put those in. Very interesting that you've brought up a number of issues that we talk about all the time, such as public choice theory. Clearly politicians wanted to be seen to be doing something and also carry in favor in order to get reelected or bureaucrats to build their empires as it were. And also rent seeking, those uh, entrepreneurs in some ways who understand that you know, rather than necessarily seeking customers, there's a market out there in subsidies uh, um, and grants to be had. So let's move to the Q&A. Can I ask, um, you know, please, uh, to, to, uh, to uh, anyone looking, uh, viewing today, please start typing your questions. Uh, the very first question is from Professor Market Ricketts, who's done a lot of work at the University of Buckingham on, and, and before that on the theory of the firm. So I'll read out his question first of all. And can I ask others to please submit their questions? First question is conventional economic theory emphasizes the positive spillovers from innovation and assumes that it must result in suboptimal investment. The alternative is that scientists and entrepreneurs congregate together precisely to take advantage of, of spillovers and do not regard external effects as a loss of, or disadvantage. Is this misunderstanding about the nature of scientific and technical change at the root of mistaken industrial policy? Or is it entirely a matter of cynical rent seeking? This is a very good question. And as we highlight in our book, uh, the Arrow theorem from the 1960s is really one of the reasons that you have any type of policy like this. So the Arrow theorem holds that unless there are um, intellectual property rights allowing firms to reap the long-term benefits of very expensive and uncertain investments in research that they do, um, there will be under investments. This is, by the way, wh why we have polytechnics and uh, public investment in higher education. And the public investment in higher ed education is good. What we have seen in these studies is that usually a lack of well-trained workforce is the primary growth inhibitor of these firms. It's not a lack of capital, it's a lack of skilled workforce. And this is a worldwide problem. Uh, I think in Northern Europe, as well as the United States. Um, uh, however, Professor Ricketts' second question is unfortunately more to the point. Um, this is a form of rent seeking, and I wouldn't necessarily call it cynical, but it is a form of pragmatic rent seeking because of the layers of uh, different support systems being top, uh, put on top of each other. One of, of the very successful private venture capitalists we interviewed for this book said, why should I invest my series one round in firms that have no subsidies? It's so easy to get these subsidies. I mean, everyone applies will get it. So I just have them call the government and ask for the soft money so they can you know, use that for the risky investments. And, and then we go in with the hard money. So with 
these types of public support system, uh, you have kind of a, a, a layering of different type of, of um, soft money. Uh, soft money which takes time and with a lot of red tape to acquire, meaning that uh, new companies often have to invest in bureaucratic knowledge rather than you know, serving customers and developing novel products. Um, this is a form of rent seeking, yes, but I wouldn't say it's necessarily cynical. It's rather that the oversupply of support means that it's irrational for companies not to do this. Christian, do you want to add anything there at all before I move on? Well, perhaps to, to re-emphasize the, uh, the original notion developed by Arrow about market failure with regards to R&D and innovation is it's really difficult to validate empirically. Um, and if it is hard to validate something, the size of it, the location of it, um, various solutions or attempts to solve the problem will be misguided. So I think this is a story where the original theory is not necessarily wrong, but it, it is exaggerated. It is taken beyond its domain of application. And that results in all this. Uh, and this is early 1990s. You had a great industrial crisis in, in Sweden, and I think in many parts of the Western world with a deep recession early 1990s. Um, and ever since, this has been on the agenda for all policymakers in, in Sweden, in the European Union, and on a municipal level. And uh, these support systems have been put in place, um, as Carl says, layered on top of each other, meaning that there are ample opportunities for this form of subsidy entrepreneurship. And these opportunities have most likely increased over the past few years as well. Okay, let me ask you a question about um, maybe what uh, critics would say, or people who defend public subsidies or state funding. Uh, for R&D. I remember uh, Bert Rattan, uh, um, the chap who designed Spaceship One, which was the first privately funded spacecraft to enter space. He won the Ansari X Prize. Um, and he was quite critical of NASA. And he said, you know, NASA, they put all these heat tiles on the space shuttle. Um, and they didn't need to do that because actually it was the angle of approach and you know, they could have been more innovative about it. And that's how he won his prize. And when I put this to a uh, public official in the United States a few years later at, at an event, he said, no, you don't understand. The fact that NASA was there and we spent all these billions, we created the uh, base knowledge, if you like, that allowed people like Bert Rattan to go on. We didn't necessarily pick winners, of course. You know, we spent a lot of money, but we needed that, that bit of public base research to allow private uh, entrepreneurs to be able to benefit from that. How do you react to that, uh, that criticism, if you like, or that, that defense of uh, public subsidy or state so subsidy? I think this is pretty consistent with what we say in our book. We criticize direct support to uh, private companies um, aimed to enhance their competitiveness, which in a way, way is extremely unfair to all the private companies that do not apply for this support. Um, but instead they're trying to do what they're supposed to do, find good customers and serve them and serve them well. Uh, um, so, so uh, the American space race and, and also Reagan's um, attempt to outcompete uh, the Soviet Union militarily are two great examples of how government can engage in long-term R&D project and that allows for innovation and positive spillovers. And what happened there was that all these innovations were procured by NASA, uh, by the... Uh, Pentagon uh, to public universities and the innovations created by the universities later became the internet, plastic technology, um, cellular phones, what have you. Uh, but it's only because the, uh, the university professors were able to commercialize those technologies for private uh, customers. Um, and not the government taking a license that they were able to, to have these spillovers. So one can say, instead of spending 30 billion Swedish krona a year on direct support system, 
the Swedish government could set up a long-term vision of, say, um, developing uh, carbon neutral technologies or something else uh, and invest it in research. Um, the United Kingdom can do the same, uh, the European Union can do the same, etc. So the, this direct support system is a tremendous waste of money that could go into this type of positive spillovers that you uh, exemplify with. Uh, Christian, do you want to add anything there or should I move on to the next question? Well, I can add briefly uh, to, to Carl's answer. And uh, again, I think it's a matter of uh, the quantities um, that are being supplied for various purposes as well. So um, basic research is something good that, that governments perhaps invest in. Um, and universities do create new technology, new te scientific knowledge that does spill over to the rest of society but it's also a matter of to what extent that is the case and if you look at uh, research on the sources of innovation in an economy and you're always struck by how little uh, that actually comes from universities uh, and most innovations do come from the private sector Research on academic patenting normally estimates that the amount of the share of patents in an economy that comes from a u university is, you know, four or five percent. So the difference between engineering knowledge, technological know how, uh, innovation in terms of new business models, uh, new applications and scientific knowledge is, is tremendous and uh, often underestimated among policymakers. Good, well, we have a number of questions coming in now. Uh, can I ask, a few people have typed their questions into the chat function. Could I ask you to type your questions into the Q&A function? Or just, uh, you should be able to copy and paste it across. Um, next question is from Adam Barter, who says, do you think that the EU and multilateral organizations in general help or hinder crony capitalism compared to national governments? If so, are there any concrete reforms we can take to improve the situation? So that's a very good and tricky question. In a sense, the question is larger than the scope of our project. Um, the scope of our project is partly on evaluating the effectiveness of direct support systems, but also in outlining and discussing these other um, long-term frameworks for innovation, such as um, um, the institutions governing intellectual property, taxes, um, educational institutions, uh, lower and higher education, etc. And uh, in that respect, I think that multilateral organizations and national governments has a large role to play. Take, for example, um, the European Union's recent uh, uh, conflicts with large American tech firms uh, of, say, um, unfair competition, uh, lock-in into technological platforms and the like. This is almost identical with what the uh, American government did harshly and swiftly uh, back in the 1920s and 1960s when they started to regulate monopolies. We know that private monopolies are not good for innovation and growth. Um, so there is a keen and important role for both national and international policymakers. What, however, tends to be more emphasized by both the national and international policymakers are not the kind of herding or, or guarding approach of safeguarding the institutions of capitalism, but rather uh, the active role of steering capitalist companies in one direction or the other, such as you should all invest in solar technology or something else, which is currently the case in the European Union. This is a very dangerous approach. It's been tested before and with disastrous results. So in some areas, governments need to take swift action, such as safeguarding against emerging monopolies. In other areas, governments are just poking around and basically destroying the incentive system of well-functioning markets. I hope that 
pretty much answers your question, Adam. And uh, Christian, I'm going to give both of you a chance. Do you want to add anything there, Christian, at all? Well, just uh, very briefly, I think generally with another layer that imposes regulation, you get even more compliance cost, and compliance cost is subject to economies of scale. So for a large bank, it's a source of competitive advantage to uh, comply with all these regulations as opposed to a small bank. So uh, generally, I, I would say it fosters um, what you refer to here as, as crony capitalism, yes. Well, thank you very much for those questions, Adam. Um, thank you also for other people who have started to ask questions. Uh, could I also ask you, if you don't want to ask a question, but you want to uh, go to the Q&A function and vote for the questions, and that helps me decide which question to pick next. Very pleased to be joined today by uh, Lucy Minford. Um, in fact, in the book that I made reference to in the chat function, she writes about the role of entrepreneurship and growth. And Lucy's question, Dr. Lucy Minford's question, is related to entrepreneurship. She asks, most of the discussion has been about R&D, but entrepreneurs also drive innovation. Is there any issue around inequality? That is a relationship between entrepreneurship and household wealth. Does this motivate some government subsidies to small entrepreneurs without their own collateral that the banking system requires? So this is a very, very good question, Lucy. Uh, unfortunately, these systems are actually designed to enhance inequality, both in terms of who gets support system and in terms of outcomes. So, um, in a well-functioning competitive entrepreneurial economy, uh, entrepreneurs launch innovations uh, that lead customers to prefer one from others. And of course, in turn, generating some inequality by some entrepreneurs becoming poorer and some entrepreneurs becoming richer. But on the margin, the whole of society benefits because customers save money, um, employees get new jobs, etc., etc. What Lucy is rightly pointing at is that in many uh, developed economies, especially welfare economies like Scandinavia, people have very little savings and you need to have savings to start companies. Um, so there is a, perhaps a role for governments to play in incentivizing and helping people, everyday people, to take a little bit of risk to be able to put that down payment on the business, to incorporate the business, uh, to have a legal, uh, limited liability business instead of a sole proprietorship. And this is a very different type of policy than the policy we are critiquing. Um, that policy um, is consistent with other type of cash transfers, such as unemployment insurance, uh, parental leave insurance, um, study loans or grants for university students, all of which have actually shown that people that get these types of cash transfer are more likely to start businesses. Um, however, the systems that we criticize, they are uh, support systems do doling out quite significant sums of money to already existing new and small enterprises and those enterprises has to go through a lot of application and red tape in acquiring the funds. And in doing so, this tends to be a little bit of bartering and negotiation leading, for example, to 80 to 90 percent of, of recipients being high run by highly educated white men. Uh, and the system in Sweden has actually been criticized most recently in, in the February issue of, of uh, Harvard Business Review for incentivizing specifically these types of segmentation structures. So people that are trained to negotiate, perhaps us that trade at business schools, uh, they have an easier time accessing these funds than the everyday entrepreneur in access of liquidity. Uh, so I would say, unfortunately, if anything, this public support system enhances inequality rather than decrease them. I hope that answers your question, Lucy. Thanks, and Christian, do you want to add anything? Uh, well, I think a, a quote here that is um, instructive is from a former professor in Sweden named Gunnar Eliasson. And he, he said that when you take money out of the private sector and then hand it back as some form of grant, you wash the competence out of that capital. The, the money in its original location 
was a form of intelligent money located there, uh, accumulated by an individual uh, with certain social capital, certain human capital, where they would be able to put that to work. And uh, all that local knowledge of, of the money is lost. So in, it's a kind of a Hayekian argument to it, really. Okay, so look, um, next question is uh, from an anonymous attendee. We've got about uh, six questions left, about 15 minutes, so we might be able to get, get through them all. Um, anonymous attendee, and I'm going to also group two questions together, asks about the EU precaution principle. Does it make innovation by private uh, players less attractive, further increasing the attractiveness of government support of innovation attempts? And maybe you could touch in your answer about, about this debate of the EU between the precautionary principle, is it the over precautionary principle versus say the innovation principle and which one has the upper hand in policy makers' minds? Wh whichever one of you want to take this question first, please. So I can take an attempt and um, Christian can fill in. The problem with these types of, one can say, um, legislatures and, and, and policies that are not directly uh, geared towards innovation policy, but strongly affects innovation policy, is that they often not included in the recipes being evaluated. So the EU precautionary principle can well play this role as you described. The problem is we don't really know. Um, so uh, what American um, uh, legislators have been pushed on uh, in the last couple of administrations is that they have to motivate all new legislation from a sort of competition and free market perspective. Uh, so for every piece of legislation added, the impact on well-functioning markets has to be evaluated. That is not the case in the EU, which means that on the one side, you can have um, new legislation that actually is aimed at enhancing innovation. And on the other side, the, you can have a whole stack of, of new laws being enacted that destroys the initiative done uh, on the first side. Um, so I really can't answer the specific implication of the EU precautionary principle, but your question points at a larger picture, and that is that these types of legislatures are seldom evaluated from an innovation perspective. Christian, did you want to add? Nothing really here. No, okay. thank you. Great, thanks. Let's move on next. Thank you very much to the anonymous attendee. Um, next one is Mart Marty Jimenez Mosbach. Um, he asks, uh, asks uh, make it easier to work and to build homes offices near places with R&D intensive industries would have a great impact on innovation, diffusion and adoption. Would you agree that removing restrictions to immigration and housing is one of the most effective tools within innovation policy? Now, let me just add to that. If you think about, for example, when, when I was a, a, a politician at the European level and we would look at innovation, one of the places we would look at was the uh, Silicon Valley. And what we found about Silicon Valley was actually it wasn't trying to get the best of American innovation compared to uh, European policymakers who would say, we need European innovation. What it wanted was the best of innovation from across the world to come to Silicon Valley. So I, I, just, I just wanted to add that to the question. Um, you know, given, you know, do you agree that removing these restrictions, not only so maybe building homes or offices near r and industries, but housing and immigration would help innovation policy? Over to you. Yeah, so I can I can start with that one. And uh, if you if you look at countries where the government has had quite a, an instrumental role in in innovation, like Taiwan in the 1980s, 1990s, this is what they have done. They managed to make it a lot easier for home returning engineers. Uh, to settle in uh, in a cluster or at a particular science park, uh, the issue was one of making sure they got a good kindergarten. They uh, made it possible to have deductions for uh, uh, rent, etc. If they located in a certain area where they would be technology intensive, so um, trying to create those spillovers by steering, uh, creating more favorable conditions, I think that has been quite successful, yes. And again, this is something 
when, when innovation policy becomes housing policy, as pointed out here in, in the question, it becomes less of a direct effect for a policymaker that they're able to say that they have accomplished something, that they have done something. And this is why innovation policy tends to become um, patents, academic research that should be commercialized, whereas the picture is much, much broader. Okay, I'm going to move on quickly, Carl. Excuse me for being rude, if that is rude, but I, uh, we've got about uh, four more questions. Let's see if we can get through them. Uh, Joshua Douglas asks, do you think the onus of innovation within the economy lies on the government? Or should firms start to make more of an active responsibility for its spillover effects on the economy? Which one of you wants to take that one? This is a tricky one because it's two questions in one. I will, oh. I will try to start with the first question, Joshua. I think that the onus of innovation in the economy can never lie with the government. The government is voted into power to uh, create um, collective institutions, police force, healthcare, um, public health, not to mention. Uh, um, so the government is not designed to take risk, to make very risky decisions, to bet on the future. And this is something that private actors are incentivized to do. Uh, and this is something the governments should not and often cannot do. What governments can do is really try to act as gardeners of innovation rather than innovators themselves. And Chris, do you want to make an attempt to answer a second question or am I putting you on the spot there? So um, the, um, over the past, years, we've seen the arguments by uh, Mariana Mazzucato, uh, who wrote this book, The Entrepreneurial State, pretty much saying that the state has had an underrated and underestimated role with regards to innovation in, in the United States and, and elsewhere. Um, and that book has sort of created that role for publishers, which is partly, I think, now, if you scratch on, on the surface, uh, there is really just anecdotal evidence pre um, for those quite, quite strong. And those statement that, that was behind um, all main in the iPhone is simply not true. And uh, you, you can read any technologies, not the case. Okay, I think we're having a few audio issues with you, Christian. So I'm going to have to, uh, we'll see what happens next. We, we, you were dropping in and out, unfortunately, there. Let's move on to the next question from the anonymous attendee. What do you think will be the long-term impact of EU investment in the economies of Poland, Romania, Greece, and other net receivers? Do you think these subsidies investments will be sufficient enough to keep their economies growing after they are withdrawn? Or will future subsidies investments in other member states prevent this? Uh, Carl, do you want to have a go? And then we'll see if Christian can get his audio back. Yes. Um, so um, a problem with these types of investments is that uh, they're often doled out as political packages. Uh, so similar as the American package uh, uh, doled out by Obama in 2009, um, these packages come in a large format covering a lot of different things. So while it may be beneficial for the whole of the European Union and other countries that we have paved roads or technology infrastructure across Europe, uh, while that may be a wise investment, the way that those investments are made is not is poorly designed, um, and uh, this is outside the realm of our, our, our book. But we see very clearly in evaluations being made that when you funnel central money from the European Union directly to private companies that are uh, doled out by national agencies, those private companies tend to be those with 
social networks to those national agencies, i.e. corruption. There's wide corruption in these types of investments, meaning that roads are built much lower or not at all uh, in the wrong area, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so overall, uh, these types of policies could have a positive effect if they were initiated wisely. Unfortunately, they are not. Great. Well, we've got about four more minutes for a couple of questions. Let's see if we can get them both in. I'll turn to Rebecca Lowe first. Uh, Martin, I hope you'll have, uh, uh, excuse my chivalry here, but uh, you've asked a question already, and hopefully we'll get back to your second question. So Rebecca Lowe asks, what role can patient capital play? Is there a role for government incentivizing the setup of institutions like, for example, the ICFC uh, in the UK? That's the Industrial and Commercial Finance Corporation, which provides finance for small and medium-sized firms. So right now, our collaborator in this project, Dr. Anders Kerner, is investigating the Swedish equivalent of uh, uh, the UK bank, um, which is called Almi. Uh, this is a very good uh, example of problems creating problems because with a well-functioning um, financial market, uh, it wouldn't be a problem in lending to small businesses. The problem has been since the financial crisis and other types of issues, the, um, uh, the regulatory hurdle and the oversight of corporate banking is so immense that uh, banks are reluctant to lend money to anyone but the house owner or a large established corporation uh, compared to in the past. So essentially regulators has created a problem which they then try to solve by setting up alternative institutions uh, such as this bank or, um, uh, or the Swedish equivalent. Um, I'm not saying that, that the loans given are bad per se, but uh, it's, uh, it's an example of a problem created by uh, administrative excess in other areas of the economy. Yeah, I often found that when I used to speak to entrepreneurs applying for loans from these sort of organizations, that they said, look, you know, we're so busy just trying to exist or you know, get our idea out there. We don't have time to fill out all the paperwork whereas some of the larger firms actually have whole departments dedicated to filling out these forms. So in fact, you know, we are, we are, we are at a disadvantage. Okay, I'm gonna ask the last question. Uh, Christian, I'm gonna give you a chance to test your audio to see if you're back. If not, I'll have to go to Carl. Um, but it's, Ma right it's Ma Ma Martin Ricketts um, uh, um, mentions, it says, you mentioned crowding out effect of government funding. Have you managed to measure the extent of crowding out? Is the mechanism a reduction in private resources devoted to innovation in general? Or does it take the form of diversion of talent away from satisfying market demands towards government priorities? Over to you. Sorry, if you want to see the question, it's now in the answer box. So I can take a step first. Yes. Um, we really can't distinguish between these two mechanisms, but both are plausible. So basically what happens when these companies have to spend hours and hours of paperwork, uh, they focus away from what should be the core competency area, developing products and serving customers. So, so one said the crowding out effect is true. Um, there's also an additional answer, and that's the second uh, hypothesis. Um, by eventually receiving the grants, um, these companies can employ a larger workforce and pay them better, at least for a short time horizon, uh, meaning that they may stick with uh, uh, staff, which is too good for them, and staff that should rather move elsewhere uh, uh, based on their education credentials. Uh, we can't really distinguish which of these effects is larger, but we know that both play a role in these grants. Okay, Christian, do you want to have a, a, a go at this? No. Christian, how's your sound? Okay, he's in a he's in a remote area. He's okay, not to worry. Uh, not, not to worry. Okay, well, well, on that note, can I thank both uh, Christian and Carl for joining us today? It's been absolutely, uh, of, uh, it's been absolutely fascinating. Thank you for watching. 
That was clearly uh, interesting and provoking talk from both Christian and Carl, which raised a number of questions on the effectiveness of state support for innovation. For more details of our online content, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel, IEA London, and follow our podcasts on Podbean. And finally, visit our website, ia.org.uk. And to help us keep providing free content during these tough times, please do consider making a contribution, no matter how modest, by donating online at ia.org.uk. Thank you for joining us.